All right, so now we're gonna get into carbohydrate metabolism. Basically, we're gonna talk about um, how the body's access to glucose determines which metabolic pathways are used. We'll talk about how glucose is absorbed from the small intestine, how it gets transported into cells, how we regulate that, how we make go through glycogenesis, glycogenesis and glycogenolysis, and then gluconeogenesis, right? So we'll talk about all three of those processes. They're really similar sounding, so make sure to break down the terms, right? Glycogenesis, glycogen is in the name, we're building that. Glycogenolysis, we're splitting glycogen gluconeogenesis we're building new glucose right so some key things are absorption right you have to bring glucose into the bloodstream through your small intestines from the food you eat then that has to get into your from the blood into your cells we can use excess glucose to make amino acids to build protein we can use the triglyceride synthesis pathway to take glucose to make fats we can use glucose to make glycogen through glycogenesis and then cell respiration to use glucose to make ATP. And then there's the gluco, uh, the glycogenolysis to break glycogen down to make glucose and then gluconeogenesis, which is using fatty acids, amino acids, right? Non-carbohydrate type things to make glucose when we don't have enough. Everything in green here Right, which are the first three, amino acid synthesis, triglyceride synthesis, and glycogenesis, those are all anabolic. We're building up something bigger. And everything in red, cellular respiration, glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, those are all going to be catabolic. We're breaking something down. So how do we get glucose in? Right, From the food we eat inside of our gut, how does it make its way from the gut into the bloodstream? We have a symporter, right? So basically we use a, you know, a active transport. We're gonna have a sodium potassium pump to help create that, that um, gradient so that sodium can pair with glucose to bring glucose in through, into the cells in your small intestine. And then once we've gotten into the cells in the small intestine, we're gonna use a carrier just through facilitated diffusion to move from the small intestine cells to the bloodstream. So just simple, just diffusion, right? A carrier protein, just an open door, that glucose can just whoop, zip right through. So we have to use active transport to pull the glucose into the cells Right, and that's kind of what I want you to remember more than anything, using ATP, using active transport to pull glucose in from, this in from the food we eat into the small intestine cells. And then facilitated diffusion takes glucose from the small intestine cells to the bloodstream. If you have that down, I'm generally happy, right? I'm not gonna get too, too worried about the, the details there. Now we have glucose free floating in the blood. What do we do? The, the cells can't just take glucose up for nothing, right? We need facilitated diffusion, so we need a protein channel, right, to allow glucose to get in. But in order for glucose to get in, and it needs those channels, the channels have to be there. This is where insulin comes in, so insulin will bind with its receptor on the cell, and then that will tell the cell, hey, we need those glucose channel proteins come bring them to the membrane and so we, like we look at the picture here we see we go from you know having really like no glucose channels right Glu insulin binds to its receptor these glucose channels the glut4 in this case joins up with the membrane we have those channels now placed now glucose can come in this is why type 2 diabetes is a problem because the person with type 2 diabetes, all the parts are there. The problem is, is that when insulin binds to the receptor, these vesicles don't go out there, right? So we, the vesicles don't go out there. The transport proteins do not make it to the plasma membrane. And so there's no channel for glucose to get in. And so this is why the glucose in the blood remains so high in a type 2 diabetic. Um, Insulin is still being produced, but the signal is being ignored. So even though insulin binds, we're stuck in this state here, 
and so glucose builds up because it has no way in, right? Then we have glycogenesis. This is where we take that glucose to make glycogen, right? So we can't store just a bunch of free glucose, right? Because that's gonna pull water into the cell through osmosis and cause them to burst. So instead, we have to stitch those glucose together to form glycogen. And glycogen's huge. I mean, right, right here, one glycogen molecule stores about 60,000 glucoses. So you look at the picture there, like there's our glycogen, that's huge, right? Huge, huge, huge. So it's a better way to store it, right? In term, for long term, and it's not going to cause damage to the cells. So we, to do this, are going to add a phosphate to the glucose. This is gonna trap it so the glucose can't escape. And then we have the glycogen synthase enzyme to start stitching those glucose molecules together. Insulin is the one that's gonna trigger this process, right? Again, you don't need to worry about the fine details. We just wanna be able to briefly explain glycogenesis in that we are forming glycogen, right? And that there's these two kind of main steps, that glucose gets phosphorylated, so a phosphate gets added to trap it so it can't escape, and then glycogen synthase enzyme is going to start stitching those glucose molecules together to form the large glycogen molecule. So this one's not too crazy. If, if you are able to tell me, like on an exam, what I just said about glycogenesis, like the, what here's the two steps, I'd be perfectly happy, right? I'd be perfectly happy. Now glycogenolysis, we're going in reverse. We're breaking glycogen back down to the individual glucose monomers, right? Because we, we've run low in blood glucose, so we need more to be released. So this is where glycogen phosphorylase, another enzyme is gonna break down glycogen, right? And then if we dephosphor, like we get to this glucose with the phosphate, we take the phosphate off, right, by another enzyme, we now have free-floating glucose. So it's basically glycogenesis, but backwards, right? And so the, the enzymes are not identical because we have different enzymes to do a different process, but glycogenolysis and glycogenesis are very similar. They're just the same process, but in reverse. What can t trigger us to break down glycogen? Things like glucagon, which is released when our blood glucose gets low due to fasting, as well as epinephrine, which is gonna be part of our fight or flight response. Now let's say for whatever reason we need new glucose. We don't have really any available. We are not necessarily breaking it down. We're going to make some from scratch. We have gluconeogenesis. Gluco, we think glucose. Neo, we think new genesis beginning or creation. So this is the creation of a new glucose molecule, right? So we can use things like amino acids. We can use components from triglycerides like fatty acids and glycerol. We can use lactate, right, to build this. And this is great when we are fasting, right? When we don't have access to a food source for a little while, gluconeogenesis can help us use other components that we may have excess of to create new glucose. So things like cortisol, thyroid hormones, epinephrine, human growth hormone, glucagon, right? These can all stimulate this process. And basically it's like glycolysis, but backwards. So remember glycolysis from cell respiration, it's the reverse. So the fatty acids can become acetyl-CoA and enter in this process. Amino acids can be used to become pyruvate and enter in this process, but we go through gly gly um, glycolysis backwards to get to glucose. And this is only because we don't have enough glucose because for whatever reason we're fasting. We don't have access to food at that moment. So again, this, you, you really need to be able to tell these terms apart, right? I'm not super picky on spelling, right? I give some leeway when it comes to spelling. However, your spelling cannot, you, when you're writing things down on a test, your spelling cannot mean something else. So if you put glycolysis, but you really meant to put glycogenolysis, 
those are two separate processes right so keep that in mind you will have to be able to know these processes apart and they are very similar sounding so you're going to have to put in the effort to really be able to memorize what each process is and it'll be a lot easier if you remember all your roots glyco right we're thinking something with glucose or glycogen lysis to split right if you see the glyco by itself or gluco by itself think glucose if you see the glycogen then you know you're dealing with glycogen lysis you're splitting it you're breaking it just and it just nessus right that's just generation you're making it like synthesis neogenesis this is new right neo meaning new so this is for the new creation of that molecule so i'm not going to go through and just like read this to you you can pause here if you need to but just break down the terms right while you're going through and studying break down the terms because there is a lot of information hiding in the names and if you can find that information in the name you make your life a lot easier in trying to remember which one's which